and because I have been talking about Mars a lot in the last several years, today I wanted to do something a little bit different as well, just for myself, for my own entertainment. So I decided to talk about water, ice, in the solar system at the end of the day, which means we're going to have a look a little bit across the solar system. And at the end, I will talk a little bit about my research as well, just because it's fun. Uh, but uh, I, I just want you to have an appreciation of the fact that when we study a planet, be it Mars or be it Earth, in reality, what we are studying is the solar system. Our planets are a part of the solar system. They formed uh, at the beginning of the life of the solar nebula. The processes that led to their formation and their evolution derive from that moment in time when the solar nebula existed. And therefore, it's very important to study planets, including Earth. But having a, a good idea of the differences among the different planets is eventually conducive to us understanding much more also about the formation of the solar system and eventually also our place in the universe. So I hope that it will be interesting. It certainly was interesting for me to prepare. So while we wait for that famous laser pointer, um, I'm just gonna, <laughs> there it is. Yes. Oh, but I don't seem to be able to advance. Okay, I have to use the screen. All right. Let's see if this works. Yes. I try not to kill anybody. All right. So the talk was entitled um, Water and Ices in the Solar System. Ices, because naturally, when we think about ice, we think generally about water ice. But the reality is we already know some other kinds of ice, like CO2 ice, dry ice. We use it quite often uh, on Earth as well. Um, and um, there are a variety of ices throughout the solar system. So the main focus today will be water. But keep in mind, when we talk about ice in the solar system, we also mean ammonia ice or methane ice, all, all these other exotic kinds of ices as well. But why do we focus on water? Oh, it doesn't, oh, it's not very big, is it? <laughs> so the water is the link between water and life. So we know life the way that we know it. We are made about 70% of water ourselves. So it's pretty obvious to anyone that water is necessary for life. So uh, water is essential. Water and ice, why do we also worry about ice? Necessary for resource exploration. What do we mean by that? You live in Adelaide right now. You know that there is a space agency in Adelaide. You know that there is a focus for the space agency in Adelaide to um, aid the um, exploration of Earth, but also of the immediate uh, vicinity of Earth, for example, the moon and also Mars, in terms also of resources. Uh, there is a lot of, uh, of uh, expertise in Australia in terms of mining, for example. That expertise is now being sought internationally also for uh, investigating and perhaps exploring uh, also other planets in terms of looking for resources. However, what is the most important resource in the solar system if you are a human and you want to start exploring uh, and you want to extract um, material for even for commercial purposes. The most important resource remains water and therefore ice. If you go further away from the sun, uh, water will be generally in its solid form, so as ice. Uh, because without water and without ice, A, you cannot have humans anywhere, you cannot settle. And B, it's also impossible to run operations, even industrial commercial operations of any kind. And furthermore, you use the ice to extract oxygen as well for breathing. So water and ice are essential resources wherever you go in the solar system, even in terms of exploration of the solar system. So today I will be talking about a few items. Now I have uh, probably filled a lot of stuff in a talk which is gonna be relatively short, everything considered. So at any given point, when John uh, or Alan tell me to shut up, I will shut up. But 
uh, I am pretty certain that I have put some stops, uh, even if I have suddenly to leave, uh, where you get some information and you don't need to know up to the end. I, however, I hope we get to the end because that's where the cool part for me starts with regard to Mars. But so basically I hope to cover these topics. So ISRU stands for in situ resource utilization, which means if you send humans somewhere and if they have to start building outposts um, and extractive uh, operations, for example, they want to utilize the resources which are in place in situ. And so uh, we will talk a little bit about what this means. And as I mentioned earlier, water and ice are the main resources that you're going to need to run these operations. So as a matter of fact, the first resource you want to look for as you go for ISRU operation is in fact water and ice. So then we talk a little bit about habitability and the snow line, and this has nothing to do with John going skiing on the Alps every year, so he knows a different type of snow line, but that's not that one. Uh, then we will talk about the solar system distribution of water and ice. This brings it a little bit uh, closer to home with regards to the title of the lecture. And then we talk about terrestrial planetary bodies and specifically Mars, where I hope to show a little bit of my research. Everything clear so far? Everything and you, everybody enthused? <laughs> Please react. <laughs> yeah, cool. that, that's what I like to hear. Excellent. All right. So let's talk about in situ resource utilization. Let's see what it means. Now, many of you were not born, but this is a photograph from Apollo 12, uh, 52.5 years ago, more or less. Uh, and here you can see a nice looking astronaut who is filling some materials, some rocks, some samples into a canister to be taken back to Earth for analysis. So obviously the moon has been our first uh, stepping stone into the exploration of space by humans in person. Uh, and we haven't gone back there yet. So I do hope that in my lifetime, I can see humans go back to the moon. And perhaps the idea is that of establishing human oven posts there for the purpose principally of research, but also in the future, maybe exploration and resources um, and resource utilization. So we are thinking of this kind of landscape when we want to figure out whether there will be enough resources there to sustain human activities and even human life. So that's unfortunately was 52.5 years ago. And since then, uh, human presence on the moon has been kind of few and far between, I have to say, and limited to robotics. So this is our satellite, natural satellite, the moon. As you can see, it's very, very dry. So obviously you don't see rivers flowing, you don't see oceans, you don't see lake, you don't even see an atmosphere because there isn't any. So uh, it, it's really bone dry, but there are some particular locations even on the moon where uh, you can find traces of ice. Um, and this is essentially what planetary scientists slash planetary geologists look for when they investigate for the presence of, of water and ice on other planetary bodies. In the case of the moon, naturally it's ice because it's very cold. So the purpose of geologists in this instance is to uh, study the surface of the moon, explore where uh, the morphology of the surface actually can be reminiscent of some type of geological activity that might be linked also to water and geological activity linked to water, as you remember, is also magmatic activity. So magmas do spew, I mean, volcanoes do spew a lot of gases uh, when they erupt and some of those gases are of course also water. So as geologists, we have a very important role to play in the exploration of planets and therefore in the exploration of space. Because we have studied Earth for hundreds of years, we know that the traces of water are certain types of morphologies, certain types of mineralogies, and therefore our contribution to that kind of endeavor is essential. So more geologists should, should actually go into exploring the, the solar system. 
Uh, so with regard to the moon, as I mentioned earlier, you see a rather barren landscape, but in recent years, we have had some indication that there is water ice. And there were some investigations conducted by NASA missions. This is the l -Cross mission. Here you can see that near one crater, which is close to the South Pole, and the crater is called Cabeus, there is a, a very, there is an area that is constantly under shadows. So it never receives solar light. So in those particular areas are the ones that are preferentially targeted for investigation, because where you don't get um, uh, the sun, basically you keep the temperatures extremely low. And so you can concentrate, you can create cold traps that are natural cold traps for uh, uh, accumulation, of course, in minimal amount of ice. So, uh, Initially, uh, this place was investigated, and in fact, uh, it was uh, presumed by uh, various analysis in the near infrared, some equipment that, that is constantly put, put on orbiters, that there could be uh, traces of water in, in, this, uh, in the shadowed areas of this crater. And in fact, last year, there was a paper published in Nature Astronomy that did a much uh, more detailed investigation of the shadowy areas and uh, found these interesting results uh, that there are cold traps, uh, almost uh, mostly concentrated in the south polar region of the moon, but uh, there are quite a lot of them. And therefore, these are likely locations where humans could actually settle and explore and investigate for extraction of ice from the regolith. Uh, this is the location. This is the South Pole. And mm -hmm. this is the impact crater, Cabeus. And this is the area that is permanently shadowed, which was imaged. Uh, and uh, these authors in 2021 also looked for similar locations and determined that there are quite a lot of these uh, areas that are potentially called traps where humans could settle and start exploration. Make sense so far? Do you want to go to the moon? <laughs> Me too. Mars, I don't, Mars is difficult. We get to Mars, but it's more difficult. The other thing, uh, there is actually now also evidence of actual water, not only ice, but water also. So there was uh, some uh, paper published from the MCUBE, the Moon Mineralogy Mapper, otherwise known as MCUBE. Um, and um, there is, in, in, with this mapper, uh, they actually map the distribution of um, oxidrile ions OH, as you can see, so the abundance of OH. Naturally, that can mean a lot of things. Certainly, you will have uh, these ions, these radicals uh, in um, hydrated minerals, of which there are quite a few, or it could mean the presence of water. The analysis that the Moon Mineralogy Mapper did is not able to discriminate between, uh, with, between the two hypotheses. But uh, in last year, in 2021, another paper published in Nature Astronomy showed uh, that uh, if you uh, consider uh, the six micron uh, band uh, in, the, in the infrared, then you can discriminate very clearly uh, the OH compound that uh, the OH that is due to the water from that that is due to uh, uh, minerals containing that, that particular. Um, um, ion. Uh, so the curious thing about this is that uh, this work was actually made possible not by a spacecraft, not by a lander on the moon, but these are data that were collected from Earth. This was essentially an aeroplane that was flying from one side of the US to the other and collected, directed its instruments toward the moon as a test. They did not even intend to actually uh, do that experiment. They just said, we just want to see if the instruments work. So they pointed them to the moon. And once they started analyzing the result, they realized that this was something quite significant. So they actually could observe that there is a very clear distribution of the six micron band that corresponds 
to that three micron band of the previous paper that I showed. And therefore, uh, in this case, there was a correspondence between the OH, uh, the distribution of the OH um, radical with the examination of where the site, the, the six micron band was absorbed. And the, the difference between the six micron and three micron band is that the six micron actually tells you exactly that is water molecules. So that was a definitive answer to the question that was posed from the previous study. And uh, naturally also in this case, you see that the latitudes at which these data were collected, where you observe the six micron band absorption, were uh, you know, relatively high latitude, close to the poles. But nonetheless, you can expect to find also, also molecules of water. Now, is this water extractable and useful? Well, first of all, there isn't that much anyway. So we are still looking at traces of water and we don't even know exactly where this water is. So one hypothesis is that this water could be in fact uh, contained into the droplets of melt that are formed, so in glass essentially, that is formed when impactors uh, fall on the surface of the moon and then clearly you start melting the surface because of the impact and some of these droplets are formed, they can be glassy and within this glass there are there may be these molecules of water and that would be rather difficult to extract. But uh, it's also possible that these molecules of water may be in the pores uh, of, uh, of the regolith itself and that would be the easiest one to extract. Now it with this data, we don't know yet, so there will be need for additional uh, experiments. But all of this is kind of encouraging. However, as a friend of mine once told me, you would have to squeeze the entire moon in order to get a cup of coffee. And so maybe it's not really uh, encouraging in the sense of having a lot of it. In fact, there isn't a lot of it. But um, at the very least, we know that we need to be in permanently shadowed areas to have a chance to obtain better resources on the field um, for, uh, for exploration and eventually also for mining operations. Make sense? Everyone with me so far? Cool. So in fact, a bunch of people are already thinking about going to the moon for the purpose of exploration and commercialization and exploitation and using the resources. Uh, Artemis program, you certainly have heard, is a NASA-led program, but I think Australia participates in that as well. Um, and naturally, you have at the forefront the big companies like Blue Origin, SpaceX, who uh, are, are planning uh, to send their own crews uh, to the moon very soon. All right, wanna sign up? Yes, let's go. Now, having talked about ISRU, which is the least interesting part of my talk, I believe, at least for me, but it's important uh, because Australia is clearly much into that. We're going to go into the science a little bit. Let's see what we mean by habitability and let's see what we mean by the snow line. So, first the definition CHZ or HZ circumstellar habitable zone. What do you think it means? Anyone, suggestions? Raise your hand or speak. What does habitable mean in English? Livable, good, good. So livable zone. So what do you need to live for on earth, for example? Water, yeah, I was gonna say a wild guess. Water, that's very good. So the circumstellar habitable zone clearly means the area or the zone around the star, which we call a primary in astronomy, where you can find liquid water. So what's the requirement there where you can find liquid water? Well, first of all, you have to be close enough to the star, which is warm enough so that you have liquid water instead of ice. But on the other hand, you want to be far enough that the temperatures on the surface of an object in that region are not too high, otherwise you cannot live, right? So each star will have its own particular uh, habitable zone. So the distance from the star 
uh, depends very strongly on the type of star that you have. So by definition, and you could have read this, zones surrounding a star where liquid water would be stable on the surface of an Earth-like planet. Why does it have to be Earth-like? What other types of planets exist out there? Answers? Yes. Would you want to live on the surface of a gas planet? No. Well, kind of there is, but you don't want to live there anyway, right? <laughs> so good, you want to live somewhere which reminds you of home. For those long nights when the sun sets and you miss, <laughs> like Dante Alighieri would say. All right, so we now know what the, the definition of a circumstellar habitable zone. I'm gonna spare you this, but you can calculate what this distance is based on uh, the size of the star and the age of the star as well. So this is a very nice diagram uh, in which here are represented different types of stars. Uh, here is how much of the stellar flux, which means that the photons can reach the surface of a planet. Um, at, and here you have the temperature of the star. This one here is our sun. And in fact, I think I can show you where we are. This is the, the sun. So this would be the temperature of the sun more or less. This is where Earth is located. Is there life on Earth? Yeah. There is life in this room. So clearly Earth falls in the habitable zone. So relative to our sun, this is the habitable zone for our solar system. Where is Mars? Mars is located here. It's outside of the habitable zone as we know it today. The question is, could have Mars been in the habitable zone some billion years ago. How do we know that? Not because Mars would have migrated, but maybe there were different characteristics of our star as it evolved through time. Does it make sense? All right, that's a hypothesis. But when we, we go and explore that hypothesis, we find out that the sun was actually much colder in the past. So that hypothesis is not viable. However, we know because we study Mars that there are traces, geomorphological traces of the fact that there may have been water in the past on Mars. How is that possible? What do you think? If Mars was never in the habitable zone of the sun, then there must have been some other factor that might have made the surface of Mars, at least for short periods of time in the past, habitable in the sense of having liquid water. And so you have to start thinking already. This diagram is simply based on astronomical parameters, but we have not yet spoken about how the geology actually plays a major role in making a planet habitable or not. So this is one factor, but studying Mars, studying other planets, and that's why comparative planetology is important, and now studying even extrasolar systems, so outside of our own solar system, we know that um, the astronomical factors are just one component of what can make a habitable zone, and therefore what can make a planet habitable. Geology is as important as astronomy in that sense. Make sense to you guys? Cool. Right, now let's have a look therefore at our solar system. I'm gonna skip this even though it's cute, but we can go back later. So how do we distinguish the objects in our solar system? And here, as with geology, astronomy also is based on classification quite a lot. So we classify the objects in the solar system by type or by location. By type, we have a primary, which is our sun, that's our star, right? Then there are periodic objects. These are all those objects that periodically revolve around the sun, like the Earth is a periodic object because it revolves around the sun every year and so forth. So this would be the planet. And of the planets, as we already mentioned, we have terrestrial type planets like Earth, Jovian, or like the gas that were mentioned before, and dwarf planets, Pluto now is that. Then we have also the moons of the planets, so they revolve around the planets and together with the planets revolve around the sun. Asteroids are also mostly periodic, comets are mostly periodic. Occasionally they become rogue, their orbits get disrupted 
and therefore they become no longer periodic, they, they, they can become dangerous. But these tend to be periodic objects. Non-periodic objects are in fact rogue, rogue asteroids and non-periodic comets. So the smaller objects can come from everywhere, but generally there is a concentration of asteroids and comets that is uh, quite periodic, where the periodic asteroids mostly are based within Mars and Jupiter orbits, and the comets are mostly in the Kuiper belt, which is beyond Pluto. So by location, therefore, we can distinguish the objects in the inner system, which are the sun, the terrestrial planet, the moons of the terrestrial planet, and the asteroid belt, which I mentioned earlier, between Mars and Jupiter orbits. In the outer systems, you have the gas giants, the ice giants, centers, which are a kind of asteroids that are far farther away, moons and other asteroids, etc., and the trans-Neptunian Kuiper belt and dwarf planets. This is, means beyond the planet Neptune, farther away. And farther than that, you have the Earth cloud and Sedna, which is another kind of asteroid. Now, having talked about that, I just want to give you a view of the solar system. These are all the spacecraft that have gone really far, far, far away. Voyager 1 and 2 are already beyond the solar system. They have gone further away. Uh, this is clearly the sun at the center. Uh, so this flat place here, this flat pancake shape ring is the Kuiper belt. That's where all the comets come from as well as there is other material like uh, asteroids, meteorites, etc. But the comets mostly come from here. What are comets made of? <coughs> Do we know what comets are made of? Cloud? Um, ice. Cool. Yes, there are volatiles, there is ice. So, so this should already give you an idea that if the comets are mostly concentrated here, there must be a lot of ice in the Kuiper belt. So intuitively, you can already see that there must be a difference between the material that forms the inner part of the solar system and the material that you find further out. Make sense? Cool. So when we take Actually, I'm going to show this. Yes, I'm going to very briefly show this. If we take the Earth as an example, uh, these are astronomical parameters here, orbital semi-axis, etc. But then you have the radius, and then you have number of satellites, rotation period, etc. As you can see, we all put a value of one here, because normally when we do comparative planetology, we compare the other objects to the Earth. So Earth is our reference, and therefore all of those ratios of radius of the Earth versus radius of the Earth is obviously one, etc. But this is easier to compare in this way the other, the other objects, whether they're bigger, whether they have a bigger gravity or a smaller gravity, and so forth. Now, without going into the details of this, because we are not doing astronomy tonight, but one interesting thing is that, again, you see that there is a clear differentiation between the outer solar system objects where you have concentration of ice and the inner solar system objects where you have concentration of rocks. Why is that? It's obvious, right? Come on, guys. You are closer to the sun. So all of your volatiles and water being one of those volatiles would tend to, you know, be elsewhere. It, mostly you have high metallicity, how we define it, closer to the star, and then all of your volatiles will be able to survive farther away. So it's obvious that the planetary objects and the objects that are farther of the sun would have the highest concentration of volatiles. That's where you will find your ices. Make sense? Cool. So why is that? And that all has to do with planetary formation from the solar nebula. Uh, there are three stages of planetary formation. There is nebular contraction, condensation, and accretion. 
But uh, living alone, obviously, this is a nebula. You can see it looks like a cloud. That's what the word nebula means. Then there are all these magnetic fields that start forming within. And with these magnetic fields, they pull matter apart. Local gravity fields develop. You start pulling apart the cloud until a dominant gravity field and magnetic field forms. And then because of the uh, uh, conservation of momentum, you have the distribution of the material in a disk. And this is your solar nebula at the formation was this flat disk. And from this flat disk, you then have the formation of the planets all along more or less the same plane with some exception, make sense? So that's how it happens. Now, if it all starts from the center where the sun is, Obviously, then you have the material that is here will be hotter, the material that is farther away will be colder, and that's where you concentrate that difference material. Therefore, if you've already done ge chemi geochemistry with John, <laughs> presumably, uh, then you would know that when we talk about the bulk composition of planet Earth, uh, as well as the bulk composition of other planets, we always assume that the bulk composition is similar to a certain type of chondrite, of meteorite, right? Because uh, that's generally a very good assumption. Uh, it's very workable. We, with that assumption, we explain a lot of things that we observe in geology and geochemistry. But it's not 100% precise when you look at this picture here, when you know that there must have been a little bit of difference between the type of material uh, closer to the sun and farther away. So that even though, for example, Earth and Mars are roughly similar, there are a lot of differences between the two planets. Make sense? So for the first stage approximation, we can look at the processes on Mars with the optics of producing materials for example, volcanic processes similar to Earth, because we started from similar material accreted to form the planets. But there are subtle differences because there are differences in the orbits of the two planets, which means the two uh, uh, protoplanets would have collected material at different distances from the sun at the beginning. So likely slightly different from each other. Make sense? Whoa. So now we come, therefore, to the definition of the snow line, also known as frost or ice line. So you can read, obviously, the snow line is the distance from the protostar where the temperatures are sufficiently low for the volatile compounds to condense into solid ice. So it's kind of the reverse, if you want, of the habitable zone definition. But this is also extremely important because it does tell us where we are likely to find ices. And ices is what preserves the volatiles. If the volatiles remain in gaseous form all the time, they're gonna escape into space, they're gonna move around, but it's when you actually have them condense into ice that you can then find them, resource them, look for them, make sense? So the position of the snow line also determines the number and position of rocky bodies like terrestrial type planet and Jupiter-like bodies in a star system. And so that's where this dichotomy between the inner solar system and outer solar system, rocky bodies, icy bodies emerges from. So now we're gonna have therefore a look at the solar system distribution of water and ice. And we go back to that idea of the snow line. So this uh, picture here, this diagram here, shows you the temperatures uh, within the solar nebula and the distance from the sun of this material which was in, in the uh, planetary um, protoplanetary system. Clearly close to the sun, very high temperature. So you have these distances. Earth is located at one astronomical unit of distance from the sun, so it's located here. Then the temperatures as you move away uh, really uh, uh, cool down very, very fast so that beyond Jupiter, that's the orbit of Jupiter at five astronomical un units, more or less, you have a condensation of water ice, ammonia ice, and all other types of ices as you move forward. Make sense? 
So that's just another way of showing di diagrammatically what we said before. So if we take this nice little picture, obviously not to scale, of the solar system, the sun in the center, this is obviously the inner solar system, this is the outer solar system, this is the asteroid belt, so obviously this is Mars and this is Jupiter, and we relate this to that diagram that we just saw in the inner solar system, so for all these planetary bodies, all the terrestrial bodies, we had their formation in this part of the protoplanetary system where the temperatures were very high. So you have high concentration of metals, essentially. Whereas if you look at the outer solar system, uh, starting from the orbit of Jupiter and further beyond Kuiper Belt, you don't see, but you see a nice rogue comet here, then you would have concentration of those volatiles, ices, gases. Make sense? Isn't it cool how it all comes together? Makes sense, right? So these are just some nice images, I hope, of the of, of the for, of the components of the of the different uh, icy planets, gaseous and icy planets. So this is for Jupiter. Uh, we've established before we will not live on Jupiter, that's for sure. Uh, there is clearly metallic hydrogen here. You have all sorts of hydrogen um, and helium uh, around around the rock and ice core. Now, one interesting thing about Jupiter that I always like in the sense that it's curious is that if Jupiter had been only 10 times bigger, it would have been a star because it does contain enough uh, hydrogen and helium that it if it just had had more gravity to start pulling the pressures that would start the internal fusion, then it would have behaved just exactly like a star. And we might have ended up with a system with two stars, not just the sun in the center. But it is too small for that, uh, though for this reason is a very important planet to study. Similarly, Saturn also has got lots of hydrogen. Uh, the, the, the surface is made of uh, liquid hydrogen. Uh, you mo move further back uh, towards the, the interior of the planet, the pressure starts acting, and so you get ice. There may be a rocky core as well as, uh, as, as a nucleation place for all of these ices to nucleate around. And uh, the same thing, you get into Uranus here. Um, so you have quite a lot of hydrogen, helium, methane, um, Neptune, again, similar to, to Uranus. You have a core, which may be rock or ice. We don't know yet very well, but then all around it, there are all these volatile compounds, uh, either as ice or even as atmosphere, because these are planets with atmospheres. And then we have Pluto, the first dwarf planet. Uh, we knew very little about Pluto until a few years ago when, uh, when the New Horizon mission was successful and actually managed to get a lot of data from, from Pluto. So we now look at Pluto and there is a lot to, to, to learn. We can see that there are tectonic features, obviously in craters everywhere. Uh, the, all of this material is uh, volatiles of carbon and nitrogen uh, solidified on the surface because of the temperatures. These are ices as well, just not the water, but, but ices. And so uh, this is the interior of Pluto. We can see that it has a very large rocky core. Uh, it is a fragment of, of terrestrial type material that for some reason is quite far away from the sun. And it's possible because of the high eccentricity of its orbit, so Pluto's orbit is not more or less circular, is really elongated, that it might have been a captured uh, object. So that may be, that's why it has, it has this uh, rocky core, large rocky core, but the surface certainly covered in ices, and it does have a nitrogen atmosphere. Then, of course, the interest that we have at the moment in exploring the solar system, looking for liquid water, um, and we are looking for liquid water because of the snow line further uh, than, than the snow line, so from Jupiter orbit forward, 
Um, but where we have very cold conditions, so obviously we expect water to be ice, not liquid. But there may be some places like Europa, for example, which is one of the natural satellites of Jupiter, where underneath the very thick icy crust, you may create the condition for having liquid water, liquid oceans. And that's one of the uh, several of the missions to Jupiter system uh, are in fact going to concentrate precisely onto Europa. One of the instruments in one of the future missions will be a, a ground penetrating radar similar to the one I've used on Mars that actually can uh, send radar signals underneath this icy crust to determine whether there is liquid water. And uh, therefore, at the moment, this is the picture that we have in our mind as a possible hypothesis, where you have this thick outer crust uh, on Europa, and then underneath you may have uh, you may have um, uh, water. Another another world, and it's a satellite of Saturn and Cedulus. Uh, there is a lot of tectonic on the surface, as you can see, but this is all ice. So uh, ice is a great type of material because uh, it behaves just like a rock when it's hard enough. And it is effectively a rock in this sense. But as you can see, there is evidence of convection underneath. So if there is convection underneath, something underneath must be liquid. And we, th we think it may be liquid water, like an ocean. And in this particular case, the convection may very well be due to, uh, to spontaneous chemical reactions of, for example, serpentinization, a process that you certainly have studied in geology. So all of these notions that come from our investigation of planet Earth, geochemistry, petrology, actually are relevant to understanding whether there's gonna be liquid water elsewhere in the solar system. Isn't that fascinating, guys? Then there are obviously comets, and we mentioned the comets before. So now let's go to closer to home, the terrestrial planetary bodies. I think I would have a question by now, which is, how can there be water here? Because we are too close to the sun, right? We are within that area um, below, you know, the, uh, in the inner area, from the sun to the snow line. So if we have lost the water, how can there be water here? That's a big question. So let's go back and have a look. This is planet Earth, this is the moon, and we know that they formed in these conditions where we should have had metals. By metals, we also mean silica and all those kinds of things, right? Uh, astronomers only have three elements in their periodic table, hydrogen, helium, and metals. And so when we, when we say metals, so we really mean also silicates, iron, magnesium, all that stuff, but certainly not volatiles, no. So this is why the Earth is the way that it is, but we know that Earth has a lot of water. How did that happen, guys? We know that the structure of the Earth is like this, inner core, outer core, metal, metal for sure, silicate mantle, crust, silicate, plus some volatiles. The atmosphere, of course, is here. And all of the terrestrial planets and bodies, generally speaking, have that kind of structure. But they're supposed to be dry. Yet, Earth is wet. Mind you, the moon is not. Mars is not. So clearly, it's got nothing to do with astronomy where it is. It has to, to do with something that's peculiar to Earth. And what is peculiar to Earth relative to the other planets? The geology of Earth is different. We live on an active, uh, actively geological planet in which we have still lots of plate tectonics. We have volcanoes that spew stuff. Uh, and th th that stuff, those gases that come out of volcanoes actually keep our atmosphere. Uh, and cause global warming, as you know, so have a global warming effect, or rather a greenhouse effect, uh, that maintains water liquid on the surface of Earth. Because if it was based on the distance of Earth from the sun, the surface of Earth would be still too cold, so we would not have liquid water. So this geological activity that we've had over several billion years, that particularly with the degassing from volcanoes, 
has contributed to the atmosphere that is filled with greenhouse gases that keep the temperatures warm enough for the surface of, of Earth to have liquid water. Of course, then we humans have to go and stuff it up, but that's another story. Uh, the greenhouse uh, effect has been something which is characteristically different from Earth and Mars, and which is why on Earth we have still liquid water, we have lots of it. And why is that? And I wrote here, size matters, because Earth is bigger than Mars. So Mars obviously has had also quite a lot of volcanic activity. There are lots of volcanoes on Mars, you can see them. But Mars is much smaller than Earth, so its gravity is much less than Earth. And therefore, all of these gases that are formed by volcanic activity are not retained in the Martian atmosphere. They escape to space because the gravity is not enough to keep those molecules of gas tied up, except for CO2, which is heavier than water molecules. And therefore, that explains why the atmosphere of Mars, though tenuous, is in fact just mostly CO2, as opposed to Earth, which is mostly what? Nitrogen and oxygen. Good. All right, so this just more or less tells you the same thing that I just said. So here, the escape velocity is obviously proportional to the temperatures that we have. And what does it mean? Escape velocity is the speed, if you want, that a particular molecule uh, acquires by having a certain temperature. Now, uh, if a molecule acquires a lot of speed and the gravity of the, of the object from which uh, it should be, around which it is, is not strong enough to keep that, that velocity, then the molecule escapes. That's what it meant by escape velocity. So in other words, is the velocity that you need to get out of uh, Earth's orbit or Mars orbit or Venus orbit, etc. And based on the gravity differences in gravity, this will be different from all these planetary bodies. Make sense? So you need to put less effort in launching from Mars or the moon than from the Earth. Make sense? The same applies to molecules. Molecules have a certain uh, speed uh, velocity. Well, they have certain vibrational velocity because of the temperatures at which they are. So if these velocities that they achieve due to the temperature are higher than the escape velocity from a certain planet, they will just be lost to space, right? Yes? Let's try to figure this out. So this is Earth in this diagram here. When you look at all the, uh, the diagrams here, these positive lines here represent uh, the distribution of carbon dioxide, of oxygen, nitrogen, of water vapor, ammonia, methane. And above here, you have hydrogen and helium. All of the molecules that are above the position of a planet are lost to space. And all of the molecules that are below the position of a planet are available and stay tied up in the atmosphere. Is that clearer than what I said before? And that's because of the differences in gravity and temperatures on the surface of the planet themselves. So with this curve, you can see that the atmosphere of Earth is made of water vapor, ammonia, methane, CO2, oxygen, nitrogen, because Earth is capable of retaining all these molecules at this temperature bound to its atmosphere. Whereas with Mars, which is much smaller and has less gravity, we have that water vapor, ammonia, and methane have escaped into space because they are all above, whereas Mars can retain carbon dioxide, which is why its atmosphere is carbon dioxide rich. Is it a little bit clearer now? Cool. So size matters for the reason that the size is linked to gravity and therefore we have planets, whether they have uh, a thick atmosphere, which will be filled of greenhouse gases, which will keep the temperatures on the surface warm enough for water to be uh, liquid or not. So 
We still haven't answered though the question as to how is it possible that terrestrial type planets, which are uh, under, if you want, the snow line, still retain a lot of water. That's that's the big question still. We don't really know the water from that we have on Earth now, what its origin is. Of course, we know that there was a lot of the gassing when the planet was being formed as a protoplanet. You had lots of magma oceans, lots of the gassing. That means the gassing also of water. Uh, but a lot of that water, given the heat, the extreme heat uh, of the planet at the time, would have probably been lost to space as well. Uh, then it would have been regained by meteoritic impact, cometary impact. So there, is, there are whole branches of cosmochemistry which are looking, for example, at the isotopic ratio of the water in comets, comparing that to the isotopic ratio, uh, for example, hydrogen uh, of the water on Earth to make those comparisons. But still, there is quite a lot of research that still needs to be done. Nonetheless, once you get the molecule waters as bound to Earth, they stay there, which is great. Now, let's look at Mars. Mars is hyperarid. We said before, the atmosphere is very tenuous, is only 100 of the atmosphere of Earth, and uh, it's composed mostly of CO2. But we do see some features on the surface of Mars that remind us of valleys, of river valleys, we have outflow channels. And so we know that there has been some liquid water flowing in the past on the surface of Mars. And we certainly know that there are ice polar caps and those are mostly formed by water ice. So basically those are the ones that, that I study. Uh, this is pretty much that, that slide said the same thing. Uh, so, when I compare um, the, pres the Earth at the present day with Mars, we normally talk about the abundance of water in, on a planet uh, by this terminology, which is the global equivalent layer. So if all of the water on the planet were distributed as an ocean around the planet itself, all around the sphere of the planet, then the, the depth of that ocean gives us the gel, is essentially this gel unit of measurement. So for Earth, it's two kilometers thick. So there's quite a lot of water for Earth. On Mars, depending on the models, is 10 to 40 meters. So it, imagine how much drier Mars is than Earth. But because we have evidence of these uh, valley networks on Mars, all this geomorphology that suggests that then there may have been liquid water on the surface, then based on a bunch of modeling, uh, we have calculated that perhaps early Mars could contain as much as 500 meters of this gel value. So what does it mean though, that Mars has lost all of this water, becoming even more hard arid uh, day by day. And how does Mars uh, lose this water? Well, the, the, the answer is at the poles. The poles of the planet act as giant cryogenic traps. So when the, one of the poles is oriented closer towards the sun, then you have some sublimation from the polar cap on that side. And that material, those volatiles migrate to the cold trap, which is the opposite pole. So clearly, some of these volatiles go back and deposit at the opposite pole. But, but a lot of these volatiles in the, in the meantime gets lost to space. So not all gets recovered. Plus, there are reactions from, uh, and in fact, action from the solar wind that also causes spallation of the, mo of the molecules of uh, water and CO2 as well that are in the atmosphere. So, Mars keeps losing its atmosphere to space, keeps losing its water to space and becoming drier and drier. Now, how can we therefore imagine that there could have been liquid water on Mars? We must imagine that there must have been the conditions once for several times in the past for a number of years where uh, the, we could have raised the atmospheric pressure to a point where the atmosphere would have acted as a blanket and therefore kept 
the temperatures on the surface higher than, than now and keeping therefore whatever ice, water ice was on the surface in the liquid state. But how do you do that? So this is Mars, this is the phase diagram of water. Mars is here, Earth is here. So you can see that the conditions of pressure and temperature at the surface on Earth everywhere fall in this green uh, field of the liquid water. That's why you have liquid water on Earth. Mars is clearly in the solid field of the phase diagram. So in order to uh, have the conditions on Mars where you can melt the water and, and turn it liquid, uh, if you just increase the temperature, you go straight into the vapor field, which is why when your volatiles move from one pole to the other as a sublimation, all of these molecules sublimate and are lost to space. They don't remain retained. So to have uh, liquid water on Mars, you must simultaneously increase the temperature and the pressure. So you must follow this kind of trajectory. And how do you therefore raise the pressure? Remember this mechanism of the cold trap. We know that in the past, uh, whilst at the moment the rotation axis of Mars is similarly inclined at Earth, in the past, it has been much more inclined. That means that whatever pole was facing the sun was much closer to the sun than with the normal inclination that we know now. When that would have happened, the sublimation process would have been much faster. So you would have had much more gases getting into the atmosphere and fast moving towards the other pole. Meaning therefore that you automatically create a situation where the atmosphere becomes rather thick temporarily, but becomes rather thick. And then in these conditions, it covers the surface, warming it up in a greenhouse effect, providing therefore a good condition for where there is ice to have also some liquid water that then would last for 100,000 years more or less. And these cycles have repeated periodically on Mars uh, since the beginning of the solar system. And this represents just the situation. This is a situation of high obliquity where this polar cap is closer to the sun than in this case, for example. So when this happens, you have uh, an increased uh, pressure because you have more molecules of volatiles forming the atmosphere, staying bound for a, for a certain amount of time to the atmosphere and warming up uh, the surface. Uh, this is just a mathematical model that shows you how many times those oscillations have happened uh, in, the, in the orbital uh, axis of Mars. Uh, and this also shows that most of the history of Mars had actually been with this very high level uh, of inclination of the polar axis. So in the past, you may have had the transient situations where higher pressures would have also translated into warmer temperatures. And you would have had what we call an ice age because in those conditions, you would have had lots of ice, some melt water, even at the mid latitude. Whereas in the present situation, which is not an ice age, your ice is only concentrated at the poles with some patches as well, but mostly there. Make sense? Everyone still awake? Gosh. So I think I'm going to skip the ancient eyes and I'm going to go straight to my research because then the next question is where would we be able to find liquid water now on Mars? We know more or less what the processes have been in the past, but what about now? Uh, when we are talking about, again, human exploration, uh, we need the liquid water also because liquid water is linked to the possible presence of life. So that's another big question that we have. Was there ever life on Mars? Uh, if so, what type of life? Do we still find traces of it? Lots of the missions that are directed to Mars are based on this question. So having knowledge of where liquid water is, is essential. So I'm just gonna run this little uh, video, hoping that you can see it. Let's see what happens.
That was a cute little video that ESA, the European Space Agency, made when we published this paper uh, in Nature Astronomy. So basically, this is a follow up on a paper which was published two years before in Science, where um, the ground penetrating radar Marsis, which orbits on Mars Express uh, around Mars, uh, had discovered the first trace of liquid water at the base of the South Polar Cap. So we um, worked on more data from the ground uh, penetrating radar and we found other patches of liquid water in a close by location. So uh, when we published this paper, then the video was made by the European Space Agency to explain more or less what the discovery had been about. But essentially that's what it was. We have been exploring the polar caps of Mars, both the south and north polar caps, by probing underneath the polar caps using radar waves from the ground penetrating radar, which is an instrument on board of the satellite Mars Express. Now, Mars Express has been revolving around Mars since 2003. And we have been acquiring data from the ground penetrating radar, which is called MARSIS, since 2005. So there was a two year delay in starting to acquire the radar data because uh, that was decided by mission control. Uh, the radar had to deploy the antenna. The antenna is 40 meters long. So before doing such a risky maneuver, ESA wanted to have at least two years of data acquired by the other instruments to make sure that something gets acquired, just in case the deployment of the antenna caused problems with the navigation and or the, the safety of the hardware. So we had to wait like two years before deploying the antenna. And the first thing is when, when the command was sent to the satellite to deploy the antenna, uh, nothing happened. Then um, something happened in as some part of the antenna was deployed, but the antenna had to roll completely to deploy to become linear. So it was rolled up in the, in the spacecraft and then it had to just deploy by unrolling. The unroll didn't happen very, very well. So everyone was already pulling their hairs out until someone said, okay, let's change the trajectory of the satellite and orient it towards the sun. Maybe the mechanism got frozen while it was in space for two years. And so by doing that, after a few hours, in fact, the antenna deployed. So there had been a little bit of condensation that had kept the mechanism from unrolling. So that went well. And so since 2005, we have been acquiring greater data from Mars. Now, the data can only be acquired during the night because during the day, there is a lot of interference uh, in, the ionosphere, in the ionosphere caused by the solar wind. So during the day, you're facing the sun, there are all these uh, ionized particles from the sun. So there is not much that we can collect in terms of data for the radar. So the useful data are only the ones collected at night. And furthermore, because the um, spacecraft is in a, in a very eccentric orbit, we can only collect data that make any sense when the spacecraft is closest to Mars, to the surface of Mars, at 250, more or less, 250, 300 kilometers. Well, because in the rest of its orbit, it reaches up to 900 kilometers away from the surface. So anything that you measure then, uh, it's going to be quite difficult to interpret, assuming you measure something. So there are certain conditions that means that it takes a long time to actually make the observations that you need over the area that you need. So after, since 2005, finally it was only in 2018 uh, and using different kinds of modality to acquire data and process the data on board and then reprocess them on earth when we received them that we were able to clearly distinguish a signature coming from the subsurface from the base of the South Polar Cup, where we could say there, there is liquid water. So until then, it took, if you make your calculation, 13 years, because space missions are not easy. But uh, by then, we had learned a lot about the instrument itself and how to use it and where to point it. 
So this is the second paper, the one where we found three more bodies around the first one. And this is our nice team of misfits that actually provided you with that discovery and you are welcome. So this is the, uh, the 40 meter antenna uh, that, that I was talking about. How does it work? So bear with me for a couple of seconds. This is not difficult, it's just geometry. So this is the trajectory of Mars Express, the orbiter, and the ground penetrating radar is on Mars Express. So Mars is, which is the ground penetrating radar, sends its signal in a conical shape. If you have done remote sensing in your degrees, you know that the radar is not just a line down there, but it obviously it has a cone of observation. So I just, I just drafted here just one side of the cone. Now, the radar signal, of course, then, some of it gets bounced back um, to, to the radar from the surface. Naturally, you have uh, all these radar waves that, that bounce back and return to the spacecraft. But some of the energy also penetrates underneath. So whenever there is a, a geophysical interface, so some material that has a different geophysical properties uh, than the first material encountered, there is a boundary here, a geological boundary, and there is therefore a reflection that can be more or less strong depending on this material on which the wave is being reflected. So as your orbiter moves, you get the reflections from the subsurface, and then you have to obviously calculate where they're coming from because the orbiter has moved, you are receiving the reflection now, but the reflection was in fact corresponding to this geographical position. So there's a bunch of corrections that need to happen. So the, the thing that we, uh, we know, because uh, our team has actually built the radar and they've calibrated in such a way that strongest reflection always mean liquid water. So when we observe very strong reflections coming from the subsurface, as opposed that, that were even stronger than those coming from the surface, then that's where we interpret that there is liquid water. And so those are basically the general principles. So that I've already mentioned, mentioned, mentioned. Okay, so this was the science paper uh, in which we observed particularly in this location, uh, stronger reflections and, uh, oh, okay. And it is in this part of Mars. So this is the South Pole. This is a region which we call <coughs> Ultimis Scopuli. And we acquired radar data all around this region here. So here is the basal reflections that, as you can see, this is the surface. So this is like a, a cross-cutting surface of Mars, deeper. Um, it's like a seismogram, all it's done with a radar, right? So the surface, of course, is always more brilliant because lots of the radar waves reflect from the surface. That's inevitable. There is very little of energy that penetrates through. And then you have this very, very bright area here that from the subsurface has higher intensity even than what you get at the surface. And this material here are all different layers of ice. So this is the South Polar Cup, different layers of ice you can see, but definitely this is the brightest reflection coming from the base and it is so bright that it overwhelms the surface reflection. So because of the way that the instrument has been built, calibrated, et cetera, we interpreted it as liquid water. So since then, there have been other groups that tried to figure maybe there are other types of material that can give those very strong reflections, but none of the alternative hypotheses actually hold water, pardon the pun, we have been able to actually debunk all of those in the laboratory by running more experiments on the materials that they suggest. And we remain even more convinced than before that uh, the only type of material can be liquid water. And the fact that it is liquid water at these temperatures, which are minus 70 degrees, can only happen if you have uh, brines that contain salt. So because of the colligative uh, properties of solutions, uh, the, the water can remain liquid. We have reproduced those conditions also in the laboratory at those temperatures. And so not only we are even more convinced than before that the bright reflection are liquid water, 
But we are also now demonstrated in the laboratory and also published recently that brines is how you get those reflections as well. It's all to do with the dielectric properties of the liquid water and the more ionic um, uh, concentrations you have in the liquid water, the higher the dielectric properties. So the bright reflections is uh, saline waters at the base of the, of the South Polar Cup. So I'm gonna spare you this uh, so that there is time for some questions. It's okay, that you can read that in the paper. So essentially this is the area, this was the first liquid water detected at the base uh, of the South Polar Cup in 2018. And we had now determined at least three more areas here, here, and here. We took a threshold of dielectric permittivity, which is a geophysical parameter that we measure uh, of above 15 uh, as, as our threshold, but there may be other patches also around there. So, you know, we, because of the smoothing of the data, we can tell for sure. But certainly there are four. So this is how the surface of the South Polar Cap in the geographic location where we found this reflection looks like. It's just ice, as you can see. Uh, it's uh, very smooth. Uh, and the liquid water is located underneath uh, in this more or less in these geographic positions. And so I made a little bit of a 3D uh, view. This is the surface and 1.5 kilometers beneath the surface, this is all ice, 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 all this black stuff is where you would have those um, uh, extents of liquid water. So because of that, I got this prize and thank you very much. And I hope I entertained you enough. <laughs>